The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, where mind, mood, and what matters to you are discussed. We're broadcasting live from Toronto, Ontario, Canada on Reality Radio 101. To get on board right now, send us an email. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com And now, ladies and gentlemen, your host of the Bear Psychology Radio Show, Dr. Anna Baranowski. Hello everyone, I'm so glad that we're here together today again on this very cold, well it's cold here, minus uh, 14 um, day, and um, we're going to talk like we always do about evolving mind mood health. And I have found that the most profound changes occur when a person feels truly heard and understood. And I like to think a bit as deeply bearing witness to life evolving. We can feel incredibly stuck when we live with our fears, our stressors and our troubles alone. But when we share and we begin to have honest dialogue and feel supported, it provides a powerful foundation for us to move forward in understanding and care. Now, the topic today is, um, is one that I'm having a hard time coming to terms with. You know, I, I gave it the title as Sedition, the Lure of Power Over Truth, Why People Choose Hate and Division Over Love and Connection. And I know that it is a very controversial topic because on the 6th of January, we had a um, the news coming out of uh, the Capitol being stormed by rioters and, um, you know, Obviously, there was a great price being paid by many people. Um, some people were terrified for their lives. Um, you know, other people uh, died. Some people were uh, injured severely. Um, there were there were many people who thought that what they were doing was completely fine. Um, they were encouraged by their president. They felt to to go ahead and um, enter the Capitol. And um, we know later that, you know, many of these people have come out and said, I was there, they posted live on, on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and, you know, just put out a lot of uh, social media posts saying that they're there at the Capitol and that they've entered the building, they've broken the, the glass windows, they've, um, you know, carried away podiums and uh, basically found themselves um, in a situation amongst hundreds, thousands of people who were crammed together and um, going through a building. And people are now saying that they, they wish that they didn't go or that they, they feel like they were duped or that they're wondering, you know, what, what, was, what was really going on that you know, they, they found themselves in amongst a crowd and witnessed to violence that they didn't really want to be part of. 
Um, you know, we heard from people later that they, they wanted to be pardoned by the president before uh, he left on January the 20th, the day of the inauguration of uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. So, you know, lots and lots of confusion, lots of um, worries and fears and um, uncertainty. So, you know, why would people even want to go and be part of, um, you know, an action like this? Um, you know, you know who, who was really showing up? You know, did they realize that there was so much at stake? You know what? What kind of people were were attending the rally before? With um, at the time, uh, President Trump um, and listening to his words, and then um, going to the Capitol. Many people went to the Capitol and didn't go into the building. So you know, we have to just kind of reflect on what really happened. So remember, this is more about having a conversation, um, understanding what the drivers were. Um, you know, even understanding what what this next presidency might be about, um, what hope might look like for some people um, moving forward, and what the fears are of some people, um, you know, those that are moving forward. What I want to start with, though, is I want to start with actually um, the inauguration. I want to start with um, this really remarkable poet. Amanda Gorman, who really made history. She was the youngest um, inaugural poet, um, but, but she really spoke um, in, in great um, openness and passion. Um, her poem was about five minutes. Um, it was called The Hill We Climb. And the poet was only 22 years old and she speaks about this this new possibility and i want to just play a little piece you'll you'll hear um this introduction uh and then and then you'll hear her her poem anderson cooper is going to speak about amanda gorman and then we'll hear a piece of her poem which is just breathtaking so please join me in in listening to this and i i'd like to hear what your thoughts are on um, how she speaks and what she's speaking about. Only like the one we as a country are in right now into words, but today an extraordinary 22 year old poet did just that. Amanda Gorman is her name. She recited a poem that she wrote for this day, The Hill We Climb. I spoke to her a few moments ago, but first hear some of what she said today. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting if we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the glade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. So she's speaking from a lot of her own experience, her, her view and her longing to see democracy 
and her own experience of justice or injustice. And I, I, I'm wondering, you know, when when you listen to it, you know, what does that bring up for you? And 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 what does it mean that this young girl, this woman, 22 years old, grew up um, a, a daughter of, you know, what she a skinny a uh, black girl, as she describes herself, the daughter of slaves, um, to be a a speaker for an incoming president. You know, what what does that kind of history mean? And and what kind of impact does it have on you as you hear the words of this um, young poet speaking from this place? You know, and I wonder, you know, as you as you hear that, what kind of impact it has on you? I want you to hear CNN uh, Anderson Cooper speak about it because he's having um, a very um, kind of direct uh, interaction with with Amanda. Amanda Gorman, it is such a, a pleasure. Uh, first of all, how do you feel? Um, I feel just so overjoyed and so grateful and so humbled. You know, I came here to do the best with the poem that I could and to just see the support that's been pouring out. I, I literally can't absorb it all. So I'll be processing it for a while. The, can you just explain um, the, the, why, why this message today? What, how did you go about crafting this? Um, well, you know, I did a lot of research ever since I found out in late December that I was going to be the novel poet. So that was making sure I read all of the previous inaugural poems, um, really doing a deep literature dive of other orators who I look up to, whether it be Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln and how they speak to a nation that people are very divided. And I was around halfway through that process and kind of that research when um, the January 6th insurrection happened at the Capitol. And I'm not going to say that that completely, you know, derailed the poem because I was not surprised at what had happened. I had seen the signs and the symptoms for a while, and I was. So I want to say that it's really interesting that this young, very bright um, woman is is doing her homework, and she's really thinking about, you know, the division that was already occurring in the country and not my country i mean you know it, we're talking about the us but you know there are a lot of the same features that are occurring in the us are are happening here in canada as well you know this kind of division and how we don't see each other um you know with with an openness a willingness to recognize that we all have a right and a voice uh, and, and so she's recognizing that there are some issues that are underneath the surface and uh, trying to wrap her mind around it. It's not trying to turn a blind eye to that. But what it did is it energized me even more to believe that much more firmly in a message of hope and unity and healing. I felt like that was the type of poem that I needed to write and it was the type of poem that the country and the world needed to hear. Were there particular images from January 6th that, you know, that were, that were kind of foremost in your mind, or was it just the totality of the, the horror of, of the insurrection? Mm. I'm a poet, so often I don't work in images, I work in words and text, and so what I was actually doing is, while keeping my mental sanity, looking through the tweets and the messages and the articles and seeing what stood out. And there's a line in the poem that you might have heard, which is, we've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it. And I got that actually from looking through a few tweets and a lot of people being like, wow, this is what happens when people don't want to share the country with the rest of us. And so I took that, which often became a meme in, on Twitter, and I put that in the poem. It's so interesting to me that you, you're you not thinking visual, that you're not, it's not the images that motivate you, it, it's the, the text, the, the words that you come, come across. To me, words matter, and I think that's kind of what made this inauguration that much more sentimental and special. We've seen over the past few years the ways in which the power of words has been violated and misappropriated. And what I want to do is to kind of reclaim poetry as that site in which we can re-purify, re-sanctify, not only the Capitol building that we saw violated, but the power of words, and to invest that in kind of the highest office of the land. Uh, let me read just the last few lines uh, of, 
of your poem, and I, I apologize because I'm I'm not going to do it justice uh, as it should be done. But you said we will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. I got shivers when you said that. I mean, that is what it takes, isn't it? It's bravery. It takes bravery to, to see it and to be that light. Right. Well, I think that recitation was great. You know, I should have had you up there with me. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm so grateful you brought up the last slide. It's something that I've been seeing a lot of people repeat. And to be honest, I was concerned of whether I should include that last line of be at all. I was kind of um, deliberating between see it, be it, free it. And then I said, you know what, we, we need all of these things at once. We need that cacophony. We need to realize that hope isn't something that we ask of others. It's something that we have to demand from ourselves. So hope isn't something that we ask of others. It's something that we have to take on board ourselves. Like what a, what a wonderful thing for a 22 year old to say, what a beautiful message. And we really all need to take that on board. But you know, the, the thing that really comes across to me in listening to uh, Anderson Cooper and Amanda Gorman talk is just this whole thing of democracy. And what is that actually? Democracy, it's, it's a system of government by the whole population. You know, everybody who is an eligible member where we elect people who will represent us in government. And the idea is that we have a kind of a social, a practice of social equality, that we're all supposed to be part of that conversation and every vote, every eligible vote counts. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. I think it's something that is really easy in, in a time like this, where things get distorted to lose sight of. And, you know, with a, with a lot of, you know, kind of the, the frustrations, I think that people have experienced um, around, um, you know, COVID, I think a lot of people have turned to answers um, that allow them feel to feel like they belong to something um, and, you know, maybe have led to decisions that have not worked out as well as they may have hoped. I listened to a lot of content, um, a lot of um, videos, um, a lot of different um, sources looking at, you know, the kinds of people who were showing up to uh, the rally before with Trump, as well as to the people who entered the Capitol building, who stormed the Capitol building, who did um, damage, who hurt people. And, you know, it's, it, it is interesting that, you know, a lot of people identified with feeling that somehow uh, Trump had asked them personally to show up or that they were under the impression that they were supposed to uh, believe in, in um, something that wasn't being supported by um, a broad population or broad media, um, but rather was a very narrow slice, like, you know, the QAnon followers, um, you know, for example, um, or extremist groups, um, for example, that were holding a certain position uh, where they really wanted to hold on to power, or they believed that power was theirs no matter what um, uh, was being covered. So people would show up and they would have the cue signs or they would have, um, you know, uh, themselves, you know, talking about going and wanting to uh, hang Mike Pence or to, uh, murder Nancy Pelosi, or, you know, just these very, very violent positions. Um, and you can listen to the, you know, YouTube videos or things on Twitter, Facebook, or whatever, you know, there was, there was a lot of that stuff being flooded 
um, on the day of the uh, Capitol insurrection and, and subsequent days as well. So, I mean, when I put this out, I send out a, you know, email messaging um, through all of our social media, as well as to about 15,000 uh, people who are on our email um, list. And I got a response back from somebody. So, you know, the message was basically sedition, the lure of power over truth, why people choose hate and division over love and connection. And I talked about, you know, um, how sad I was that these things were happening, um, that, you know, there was violence and that, you know, there, there were people who were really hurt and some who lost their lives and a lot of concern um, over those people who were there afraid. So I got an email from somebody. I'm not going to read the name of the person, um, but um, this is what it said. It said, um, uh, and this was, I guess, to me uh, for sending out this, um, this message. And remember, the message is really, let's have a conversation about these issues. And by the way, if you want to send um, an email, um, in studio 101 at gmail.com. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about this topic, whatever your thoughts are. I know it's a tough one. I know it's a really complicated issue, um, but I think it's really important to grapple with the underpinning of what January 6th represented and then, you know, where we're heading from there. So this is from uh, the email that I received. Trump supporters, question mark, where do you get your information? Question mark. Oh, CNN, Trump haters. You liberals talk about peace, love, and putting the country back together. This is the message. Um, it goes on from here. Yet you want to keep the division alive by your hate for Trump and conservatives. Honestly, I really don't hate anybody. I, I really, I can't use my energy in that way. It just, it won't serve me. And it certainly doesn't serve kind of my mission, um, what I'm interested in really is what does it mean that this happened? What were the forces beneath the surface? You know, what are the drivers, you know, that somebody would get involved in a white supremacist group or, um, you know, get engaged in, um, you know, a conspiracy theory? Like what are the drivers of that that would lead somebody to go to the Capitol, enter the building, um, you know, risk their, you know, going to jail, um, you know, just, just everything that they put up, um, you know, in terms of entering the building, their own personal risk, the risk to everybody, the risk to the Congress people who were so frightened, and the Senate, you know, these were the people who were elected. So, okay, this message goes on. Um, did you read the FBI reports made public? Question mark. Yes, a lot of Trump supporters did in fact show up at the Capitol building, etc. Now this person says, and we know this, this isn't true. I've done a lot of fact checking. 18 people arrested and eight admitted per public arrest records that they hated Trump. Well, you know, Maybe there were some people that hated Trump that were there. I don't know about that. Um, but there were a lot of people who posted saying that they were there because Trump asked them to be there. Um, you know, and in fact, now that that a lot, there are hundreds of people who've actually been arrested at this point. But um, many people are going with the defense that the president asked them to be there that they were only following the orders of the president or the, the, the invitation of the president, and they don't want to be held responsible for that. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people who were there um, who really, really felt like they were there for him. Um, there were a lot of people there who were there because they, they felt that there was um, a, um, that Trump was an ultimate kind of supreme leader and that Biden was going to be arrested and that um, they had to show up because the transfer of power to Biden was never going to happen and they they needed to show up for that. Uh, of course, it did happen. And now I'm talking about QAnon. Um, and so, you know, there were a lot of people after the fact who felt that they were really misled um, and have had a lot of, 
you know, um, they've questioned themselves after they feel really let down. Um, so, okay, this email continues. The libs, again, she's talking about the liberals, making it seem that everyone that showed up to the protest were Trump supporters. Um, and then this writer says, when BLM, Black Lives Matter, and Antifa were looting, rioting, burning buildings, and hurting minority businesses, where were you condemning that behavior? So um, I'm going to just stay focused on uh, this, this issue right now. I think what the writer is saying that um, I should be um, discussing a different uh, matter or um, a Black Lives Matter uh, protest or, you know, whatever. Um, but I want to stay focused on this moment in time. Um, and, you know, of course, I, I'm not I'm not supporting looting or rioting or burning buildings or hurting minority businesses because I don't think that really serves anybody. Um, the writer goes on to say, oh, it did not fit your liberal agenda for hating Trump. So again, I, I don't really have the energy for that one. Um, but, and, and then the writer goes on and anyway, anyone that disagrees with you and the media people that you admire, oh my God, you're a hypocrite, just like all liberals. I will not be listening to your show. This topic is garbage. Please take me off your mailing list. Thank you. Okay, so, I mean, I, I just think it's, it's really unfortunate because really what I wanna do is talk about this issue. It's a really, really important thing for us to consider. How do people get engaged in activities? How do they go so far towards, um, you know, a um, inclusion in an extremist position or group? Um, are they really loving what the group is saying? Or do they love being involved in something um, that makes them feel important? You know, in one, in one case, there was this real estate agent, she was posting um, that she was on their way to the uh, Trump rally. And um, she was posting from a private jet. And, um, and then when she was on the Capitol, she was posting that they were entering the building, that they have stormed the building. And, um, and, and then goes on to say, you know, after, just before um, Trump um, left on the day of of uh, Joe Biden's inauguration that she hopes that she'll get a pardon because now she's regretting that, you know, she could go to jail for this. So, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, um, you know, it's just this question, did this person really understand um, what it meant to storm the Capitol and, you know, what this was really going to bring for, for her. Okay. So going into this idea of white supremacists, um, or extremist positions and who might be at risk of going down that road. Now, there are a number of examples of people who have had actually parents that they have um, notified the FBI were at the Capitol um, when they felt that they were themselves at risk. Um, and there's this 18-year-old uh, who, who talks about just um, having to um, go to the FBI and tell them that, you know, their dad was there and, and uh, came home. And after he came home, he threatened his 18-year-old son, um, potentially with the loss of his life, if uh, he told anybody if he went to the FBI to say that he was there. And, you know, in fact, I think that this 18-year-old was afraid for his life and the life of his uh, family. Um, and so he did contact the FBI and say, my dad was there. He, you know, he was there with, um, you know, prepared to do harm. Um, and I'm, I'm imagining it must be terrifying for somebody like that, 18 years old, and to feel so frightened um, of what is happening in your own family that you you have to go ahead and and actually you know um go to the fbi about what your your own uh father is involved in in doing so i think 
probably a very frightening event for this young person. And so, you know, now let's um, think a little bit about um, what what might have been going on for that for that young person. We're going to listen to David Packman, and he is talking about this son reporting to the FBI. This riot is growing and growing and growing. And there is a very interesting story, uh, well reported in the New York Times, about a guy named Jackson Reffitt. And Jackson Reffitt knew that his dad, Guy Reffitt, uh, was in Washington, D.C. for the riots. And two days after the riots on January 6th, Guy Reffitt returned home to the family's house in Texas. And he told his son, I was there. I was there on January 6th. I stormed the Capitol. And Guy threatened his own son, Jackson, and said, Jackson, Jackson's 18. Jackson, if you report me to the police, I'm going to have no choice but to do my duty for this country and, quote, do what I have to do. Jackson went to the FBI and Jackson told investigators that uh, his dad had been there and that he stormed the Capitol and that he threatened him and said, if you turn me in, you're a traitor and traitors get shot. Um, incredibly, this was not the first contact that Jackson had with the FBI about his dad. Weeks before the riot, um, Jackson went to the FBI and said, my dad keeps telling me he's going to do something big. And this is yet another one of those instances where we find out, and, and again, the FBI, very busy with reports all the time, the FBI is getting reports uh, for, from all sorts of different people all the time about different things. But this is not a guy who no one thought maybe had the capacity to do this. Jackson Reffitt had already told uh, law enforcement that his dad was claiming he was going to do something big. So it's, it's interesting because um, David Packman goes on to say, you know, Sometimes, you know, parents might be concerned about their ki their kids going inside of their room and watching a bunch of videos and getting lured into something that, you know, is really concerning. But in this case, it's the opposite. You've got this 18-year-old um, who's like going, something's going on with my dad and he's behaving in a way that I don't really get. And he wants to do all these things that are like really dangerous and he's threatening me and my family. And, you know, what that would be like, you know, the tables are turned. Anyways, it, it, it is a concerning thing to imagine that this 18 year old had to be brave and actually, you know, say, look, um, you know, I'm afraid. I'm afraid for my dad. I'm afraid for myself and I'm afraid for my my family and and actually go forward and have to admit this. So so again, now let's let's talk a little bit about um kind of um, extremist um, views and how people get drawn into it, you know, and how people might get drawn into QAnon online. And um, this is going to be, uh, you're going to hear a little bit from a reform neo-Nazi explaining how people fall prey to QAnon online. And this, this actually is um, with a woman, her name is Shannon Foley Martinez, and she's a former violent white supremacist working to extract others from extremist groups and says that QAnon attracts people looking for meaningful connection and a way to navigate a world that feels unsafe. Now, this is one of the things that I really believe strongly in, that there are a lot of people at this precise moment in time with um, you know increasing lockdowns. We're in a lockdown in Toronto right now where I am located. And, you know, I, I'm hearing it from a lot of people. It, it is a heartbreaking time. People are feeling deeply lonely in ways that they have never felt before. Um, you know, we're missing physical touch from those we love. Um, you know, although I'm really happy to be able to communicate with people on uh, Zoom, and I usually have between 30 and 40 meetings a week, um, it's just not the same. It's not the same. So let's listen to this. At Trump rallies, QAnon believers also began popping up in the news, often for committing violent crimes. The FBI warned last year that QAnon is a potential domestic terror threat. 
This conspiracy theory, once hidden in the shadows of the dark web, has made its way to thousands of those Facebook groups that Roger was talking about, and millions of members. It's now infiltrating a new group of targets. Brandy Zadrozny has more on that. Brandy? It's a conspiracy theory. It's a cult, and it feeds on insecurity, uncertainty, and isolation. So nationwide protests, the coming election, and a pandemic have provided just the environment to recruit and radicalize new members. Mark Andre Argentino is a data scientist and he studies extremists. He made this chart for me using CrowdTangle, which is a Facebook-owned tool. It shows the activity of hundreds of the largest QAnon groups. Do you see that spike? That's in March when states begin COVID-19 lockdown measures. So I'm just going to say, because you can't, you can't see this, but the, what, what's shown on the chart is that the numbers of QAnon believers are something like 150, 200,000. And then as soon as you get this lockdown and COVID is inflamed in early 2020, um, the numbers spike to above 1.5 million. So all of a sudden, something that was very fringe and random and, you know, did not get that much attention, might have just been, you know, a curiosity for people. I mean, I never heard of QAnon before 2020. Did any of you? Um, I mean, I just, it just never crossed um, kind of my desk in any way. And, um, and then all of a sudden, this huge spike. So people became um, more vulnerable to all of this. But it hadn't just grown. QAnon content is reaching a new audience and in some unexpected places. Anti-vaccination, anti-mask activists have embraced the conspiracy theory. Instagram is riddled with QAnon conspiracies, spread in flashy posts by lifestyle influencers, mommy bloggers, and alternative health pages. And in some 200 cities and towns across the U.S. last month, moms, often with kids in tow, gathered in their main streets, holding signs branded with QAnon messages. Now, after six months of rapid growth, Facebook finally took some action, removing some, but not all, of the QAnon groups that were explicitly discussing violence. Twitter made a similar stronger sweep the week before, and those moves have decreased, but not eliminated QAnon activity on the platform. Ali? All right, so what do you do if you've got friends, you've got coworkers, you have neighbors who believe this QAnon, QAnon stuff? Uh, Shannon Foley Martinez is, and I hope you're sitting down for this, an ex-neo-Nazi and a current Yale professor who specifically works to de-radicalize de people who've fallen victim to online radicalization. Uh, Shannon, thank you for joining us on the show. Ben, kick us off. So Shannon, first of all, thanks for coming. And second of all, I, look, we talked a few weeks ago uh, for a story about QAnon. And yes. you, know, you told me explicitly, like, I don't know what I was thinking when I was going down that white supremacist rabbit hole. Was it was it like did I lose empathy? Did I what was happening at that time? And what you were saying is it, at that point you didn't think you were becoming a bad guy, and that's really what's happening with these QAnon people, right? They they don't think they're becoming a bad guy. They think they're becoming a hero in their own story, right? Sure, I'm I'm not a Yale professor. I'm a consultant at uh, Peril at American University. Just to to clear that up. Um, so 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 you're accusing me of disinformation already. I'm just thirty minutes into the show. <laughs> provided disinformation. Don't clip that and put that on the internet. Okay, she, go ahead, Janet. <laughs> Everybody already thinks that anyway. Um, so one of the things that I didn't uh, recognize while I was um, radicalizing into what I was doing was that I was creating an echo chamber for myself. In my case, it was a physical echo chamber. I ended up only spending time with people who believed what I believed, only in spaces where this was all that was going on. And I didn't recognize that that was happening to me, that that was, that my brain got, was really like hijacked into only framing the world around this ideology and these beliefs uh, that I was uh, immersing myself in. Some of the things, one of the things that's very important is that um, these are still individual stories. It's important for us to talk about the meta, right? It's important for us to talk about this bigger, larger QAnon thing. But the people who are part of this are still individual human beings who all have a story behind how they got there. Most of the time, these stories involve um, 
some kind of trauma or layers of trauma in their lives. We know um, specifically when we're talking about women and moms. So I want to point out something really important here. She's recognizing that there's a psychology to all of this. The people who are most at risk of uh, being lured into um, groups where there are extremist positions and beliefs often have layers of their own pain and suffering that they're trying to navigate. And so here is where things get very complicated. And, you know, she, she identifies some of the issues about why people get into cults in the first place. And, and one of the things is, is that it gives you this sense that you are part of something bigger than your own pain and that something really important is there for you to engage with. And, and these things are very delicious to somebody who has a lot of emotional pain. From the Me Too movement, just how endemic uh, sexual assault and sexual violence is for women in the country. Um, that uh, the world feels dangerous and out of control to, to these people and that they're looking for something uh, that had a meaningful connection to something greater than themselves that they haven't found elsewhere. When we start interjecting the idea that children are in danger, of course, moms uh, in particular and women are like, oh, we have to save the children. Like, why has no one told me about this? And so then when they hear and they, um, they start investigating and interacting with these ideas, that there's this coming from this sense of deep disempowerment that when you feel like you have found the true truth, the real facts, which hitherto have been hidden from you, that that is very alluring and seductive and feels a lot like empowerment for a lot of people. The QAnon folks tend to be older people as opposed to um, a lot of the uh, further right wing stuff and esoteric Hitlerism stuff tends to be younger, uh, younger teenagers and young adults. But this is often middle age and older people who feel like they're tech savvy, but aren't actually really all that tech savvy. So their ability to fact check. Yeah. Um, is often really limited, and they think they are. So one of the things I, I so okay, this is another really important piece. What she's talking about is the ability to actually do a more uh, in-depth investigation into uh, information that you're being exposed to. So you know, with QAnon, there's this idea, as I mentioned before that somehow uh, Trump was going to be this ultimate leader, that he was going to be some kind of savior of some sort, and that, you know, there was no good, not ever going to be any transfer of power, um, that um, instead Trump was going to continue. And, you know, there was this, probably this difficulty once you got into Q, um, for people who didn't have all the greatest um, skills for analysis of information to look more closely at the issue. So Shannon Foley Martinez, um, you know, has taken quite a bit of time to understand what drives uh, people into these um, different uh, organizations. But remember, once you're in it and you believe you've found some truth, there would be a less of a likelihood even if you were tech savvy to go deeper because you found something that makes you feel comfortable. It, it gives you a sense of, um, you know, like uh, you're okay here with this. This makes sense to you. This is manageable. This is attainable. Um, but it, it, I'm going to walk you through some of the cult uh, drivers that um, it, it answers questions you may be confused about. So it'll give you, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. The idea is you're going to get a fire hose of information that points you in one direction. And as long as you stay connected with whatever the cult is, whatever the um, extre extremist view is, it will continue to feed you this misinformation 
to the point where, you know, that's what you look for. It reinforces itself. So you feel a certain comfort now with the content. It's drawn you in. Those individuals with low self-esteem are more likely to be persuaded by a cult environment. So well, it doesn't matter what background you come from. But, you know, when, she, when, when this woman talks about, you know, this sense of comfort in, in, in being involved in this, that there may be trauma in a person's background, you know, that trauma may lead you to feel that you want to be part of something that can make you feel a, a sense of um, connection, um, be in a supportive environment with other people who believe what you believe. Now, this is another one that's really important. Um, often in these kinds of organizations, new recruits are what we call it love bombs. So basically, Somebody, somebody who's already part of the cult reaches out in a way that makes you feel special and heard and understood and connected in ways that maybe you have not felt. And, you know, when you haven't felt that way and you, you felt kind of alone or disengaged or disenfranchised, it can really give you a, a sense of loneliness and uncertainty. And so having that sense of um, somebody's looking after you, somebody's thinking about you, somebody wants to know who you are, they care about you, you know, it can really give you um, kind of what you're looking for in anyways, in, in the short run, it might not actually give you a sense of comfort in the long run. Um, it may leave you feeling um, kind of very confused once you kind of start questioning some some of how you got to where you're at at the moment but for a short while it could certainly help you feel a certain way now that there's there's one fellow uh christopher buckley um he's from lafayette georgia he was an afghanistan war veteran um and he describes himself as a former white supremacist and he said he needed to fit in he wanted to feel like, you know, he was part of something. And, you know, there was a, there's an interview with him in um, um, where he describes just, you know, what it was like to grow up in a home where people were, you know, not paying attention to him. And he he didn't feel like he had the, the love and attention that he needed. And, you know, on one occasion, somebody... Um, you know, came to him, um, a KKK leader, and basically, you know, kind of brought him on board. And it was like one of the first times that he felt that, you know, somebody really cared what he had to say, that he was somebody that, you know, people wanted to know who he was, and he wasn't so alone anymore. And you can see how the lure of that would be so incredibly um, interesting. Like, of course, because we're really, really not meant to be alone. And we, we have to understand that, you know, it's a huge drive. If somebody can just help us feel, you know, like, like we won't have to be alone for the rest of our lives, that we matter. You know, from a psychological pr perspective, you know, it's, it's just a it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. So, you know, it makes complete sense that somebody would get drawn in so easily, um, you know, and, and, and it, and it does make sense. So, you know, when I think about somebody like um, Christopher Buckley, and, you know, what he had to go through, and what it was like to for him to um, disengage, from um, the group because he, he took this very brave position of disengaging from, um, you know, the movement. And um, of course it would have been very, very difficult for him to do that because he, you know, he, he had to face a lot of negativity um, and he had to move away from uh, the people who gave him a sense of belonging. 
So you can, you can understand why somebody would not want to leave a group like that. And it takes incredible strength to, um, to end that kind of uh, behavior. So we have to kind of really applaud people who have the, the courage and the strength to leave groups like that as well and try to understand, you know, both what drives it, you know, the, the, the longing for that sense of love and community and connection. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that women are more likely uh, than men to join a cult. Now, I don't think that's the case with white supremacist groups. So there are women who are part of white supremacist groups, as we know from Shannon Foley Martinez. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's not the whole thing. So let's listen a little bit to what Essie Cup says about what it will take to stop white supremacists. The Department of Homeland Security report reveals that white supremacists are and will remain the most persistent and lethal threat in the United States through 2021. To be sure, President Trump stoked these racial tensions, tear gassing peaceful anti-racism protesters, refusing to denounce white nationalist groups, and using racially coded language to instill fear in suburban white voters. How do we combat this threat? What comes next for white supremacists in America? Check out our op-ed on CNN Opinion and enjoy our conversation now. So again, you know, we see that people are quite concerned about this issue and that it's not something that um, is, people are imagining that this is gonna go on. It's not simply gonna stop with um, the events of today, that there is an expectation that you know, these kinds of issues um, are here for a while and that it's, it's really something that's gonna have to be addressed going forward. Um, and that, you know, despite, uh, you know, the, the change in administration, that doesn't really change the fact that, you know, there's an undercurrent of despair right now and that there, there are many people who are at risk of joining, you know, hate groups, really, um, and that it it's not really about an administration. It's it's about what's happening on a very individual level, and how loneliness and disconnection can really drive us towards hate and division, um, and and that, you know, some people don't necessarily have the immediate skills to um, fill that void in their life. And so it becomes really important to figure out what as a culture do we need to do to help people feel like, you know, they belong, that they're important, that there's a place for them. You know, that this is really, this is really a crucial thing for us to keep in mind. Um, the, the other piece around um, cults is that many cult members have rejected like classic uh, religions. And, um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to go into religion, but, you know, you can see that there was something about, um, you know, having a community around you that would um, help you feel like you belong. And as actually, fewer and fewer people are part of religions, but there hasn't been a kind of um, alternative that lets people feel like they're part of community in, um, in this state that we're in right now with you know, fewer and fewer people being engaged in religious pursuits. Cults have maintained their power by promoting a kind of an us versus them mentality. And that makes complete sense. Like, I'm, I'm so sad about this um, email that I got mostly because I think this person felt that um, she could not um, get any benefit from uh, listening to the show anymore, that I was now, um, you know, no longer part of her team or her tribe or whatever. And, you know, I think that's really unfortunate because we have something to, to talk about. Um, and it, I don't see it as an us versus them. You know, this is about we, you know, in, in more ways, then not we, as human beings, are very much the same. We, we are the same. So coming together makes more sense than breaking apart. 
And then cult leaders are masters of mind control. And this one is really, really in interesting because, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like. There's something about charisma and the ability to really reach in and have people, you know, even in a large crowd, feel like somehow you are talking to me specifically. And this is part of the reason why people felt like, I mean, Trump has high charisma. People felt that Trump was talking specifically to them. You know, when he said, come, people came because they felt he's asking me personally to come to the Capitol. I have to listen to my president. You know, there was a real kind of draw um, to feel that that was, you know, that they, that you were actually coming to be with him. Um, cult members often have no idea that they're actually in a cult. You know, um, it's just, it's just a very interesting thing that, you know, people can be part of something. Now I'm going to go back to the idea of QAnon and um, recognize that, you know, there's something about the communication strategies that are being used that give people a sense of um, being part of something, their own unique club, and they really feel like they found their tribe, um, but they have no idea that there's anything cult-like about this. Um, and then cult life can have a dangerous and lasting effect. So for those people who have found themselves engaging in, um, you know, organizations or um, kind of uh, very persuasive ways of thinking that they now are wondering if these things are true, um, recognize that you can spend, you will need to spend some time potentially overcoming the emotional damage um, that has occurred um, as a result of you having some very um, unusual or extreme positions. Um, there may be people in your life, family members, friends who you've um, disconnected with because they, you have different opinions than they do or you did. Uh, and, you know, it may mean really coming to terms with, you know, what you have said or done or uh, arrived at, you know, the ways in which you may have spoken to people. Um, because, you know, sometimes there could be really long-term effects as a result of, you know, being part of a environment like that. And, um, you know, it becomes really important to find a way to uh, communicate with the people who you, you know care for you, you know, and no matter what your position was, to find a way to reconnect in ways that are, you know, important and meaningful to you um, and to, to, you know, find um, a position that is more manageable in the long run where you know that you belong. So I'm just gonna go back finally and, and talk a bit about this one person, Christian Picciolini. He was 14 years old when he attended the first gathering of what would become Hammerskin Nation, a violent white power skinhead group. And he described um, his early introduction as an opportunity for him to feel a lifeline of acceptance. Now, this is not unusual for people getting involved in extremist groups. Um, Piccolini said, I felt a sort of energy flow through me that I have never felt before, as if I was part of something greater than myself. And as a result, of all this love bombing, what we were talking about, um, he embraced the white supremacist message uh, and he went on to, you know, um, have this become a very strong part of his life. So, you know, he actually was a co-founding member of a group called Life After Hate, which is a nonprofit that counsels members of hate groups and helps them disengage. So if you know somebody who is struggling with this kind of um, activity 
and either you're struggling or you know somebody who's struggling, um, maybe they were involved in these kinds of actions, um, uh, you know, raiding the Capitol or, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is, you know, this is a particularly um, difficult time when people have turned to unusual groups um, and extremist groups. So Life After Hate, um, it, it looks like a really powerful group with a great message. And um, I just want to remind everybody, you know, if you find that um, you're having difficulty with this period of time in your life, just understand you are not alone and um, take the time to try to connect in a way that will be meaningful for you. Um, I want to wish you a gentle day. And if you feel that it will be beneficial to you or you would enjoy it, um, you can certainly reach out to us if you would like access to our uh, trauma recovery program or um, Recovery Now Online. Trauma Recovery Now Online is now available free for those in the community as well. Wishing you all a gentle day. Be well, I'm thinking about you. Thank you for listening to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with Dr. Anna Baranowski right here on Reality Radio 101.